Wines and rough for we here to serve just what you deserve. Shout them I K. Well, let me hear let you. Let me hear you. Sing it low. We suffer in hard times with cuts and bleed. We too much if you can't ignore. Just come get on board. Why well, can't believe it's almost midnight? Joe Atherley, Joe Atherley, Arthur Holder, what are you doing down here? The people are out and the hour is about to come in for the next day. Something is, I can't hear you. Something is, and for those who are missing, you need to tell them about the quality of this platform tonight. You just heard Jeffrey Bostick. You heard Jeffrey Bostick speak like if he was an MP for years. In touch with you. In touch with the issues. You heard Ian Goodenegel. Ian Goodenegel told you what was going on in tourism and you heard your candidate Joe Atherley whose campaign office we have the honor of being in front of tonight and you heard Arthur Holder who happens still to be on the Royal Avenue's Station Hill and Dean's Village and you heard of course the leader of the Barbados Labour Party after this meeting tonight, the people of Bank Hall, the people of Hainsbury Road, the people of Station Hill, the people of Bush Hall, the people of Eagle Hall can be in no doubt about the quality and the credibility of the candidates of the Barbados Labour Party. But I have come here tonight to talk to you about confessions and credibility. Because sometimes, and, and people around here know about confessions because sometimes people is get confessions beat out of them. Then we get real. But we didn't need to beat any confessions out of the Democratic Labour Party. They talk like how sick baby belly, sick, a sick belly baby is B. It just ran. And today, those of you who listen to the news heard your Prime Minister of Barbados you can call him that because he will be that until the 21st and not another day after. He is the Prime Minister of Barbados, Jew is Jew. But you heard him tonight and today on radio make the absolute confession that should seal the deal for you, the people of St. Michael. And I want to share something with you. We have been doing our own internal work and our reviews as to what the people of St. Michael feel. We don't just come on this platform and tell you what we feel you should hear. We take the time out and between canvassing and polling and all other things, we tell you what we believe you have said to us and address the issues that you feel are important. And bar none, St. Michael is unique because the people of St. Michael have said, and listen to me carefully, the people of St. Michael have said, that the most important thing is jobs. Christchurch and St. James, it is cost of living. For the people of St. Michael, cost of living is important. 
But if you don't have a job, it don't matter what the cost of living is because you don't have any money anyhow. And I say from this platform tonight that what the Democratic Labour Party has done to the people of St. Michael is nothing short of criminal. Because almost one in every three people, you hear the figures? One in every three are without jobs in St. Michael. And St. Michael has over 100,000 people living in it. And what therefore you expect to hear in this campaign in St. Michael is that job number one is still jobs. And therefore, when a prime minister comes to you and tells you that a Labour Party who says that they're going to put money back in your pocket, well, if you want money, the drug lords have money. It is an insult to the people of this country, but more so to the people of St. Michael, because... The people of St. Michael are not looking to drug lords for money. You, you understand what the man said to you, youngster? The people of St. Michael are looking for jobs. The people of St. Michael feel that if they get a job, they can keep money in their pocket. The people of St. Michael want an opportunity to feel like a man or a woman and stand tall. Last night I told you in Bushall that people in Barbados used to be in the grandstand. They had a piece of change in your pocket. You could decide what you wanted to do. You had options. And this government took us and put us in the bleachers with the sun and the rain pouring down on you. But we are here to tell you that we will put you back in the grandstand. Because we are going to give you jobs and we are going to put money back in your pockets. But the Prime Minister's statement, apart from being contemptuous of you, was also an admission on his part that he does not know how to put money back in your pockets and he does not know how to give you, the people, us and Michael jobs again so that you can save and put yourself back in a position of being able to deal with your own family. And you know, ladies and gentlemen, when I make fun on this platform and tell you, mocking Papa San, Lord, me can't take it no more. People laugh. I laugh. But that is what people tell themselves in the dark of the night. That is what people tell themselves, mothers, who got to get up and know that they ain't got no breakfast to get the children. They ain't got nothing. Wondering what they can get them to eat in the evening and hoping that they get to eat little school meals at primary school. I watch people going at supermarkets around St. Michael's, small and large. And when they get by the cash register, what they're doing? Pop back, add up. And if I am around, I will pay for somebody who can't make it. And there are other people who will do that. But they're not guaranteed that when you get to the cash register, somebody there to help you. And there's some people, I had a woman come to me last week. Her land is about to be sold out. I have known this woman for 21 years. She has a small business. She has never, ever, ever asked for 10 cents. And she came in tears and she said, Miss Motley, I don't want it as a gift as Lord is my witness. I don't want it as a gift. I want a loan. I want a loan. I have a meeting turn coming in. In three, four months time, I'm going to give it back to you. And I'm telling you that that story is not unique to me. 
Every single candidate of the Barbados Labour Party can give you story, chapter after chapter after chapter of how hard it is. And I see people going by Ashton's shop and let them bear me out. All of you in the pine now, so you ain't down there very often. Danny and them will tell you, Rhonda will tell you. And instead of people buying a whole set of stuff in the supermarket now for the children for school or to eat, they buy piecemeal. They buy for one day at a time. One day at a time. And they tell me, a youngster told me last weekend, he said, you know, that any morning I wake up with a $20 in my pocket, I feel like a king. You, you understand that in 2013, a man telling you that if he wakes up with a $20 in his pocket, a young man, a young strong man, tells you that he feels like a king. So when I tell you that it is a confession of incompetence, by the end of my speech tonight, you will return the verdict and the sentence. Because this is just the evidence. And it is not for me to judge. But it is for you to give a preliminary judgment, a preliminary sentence, and then for you to make sure that the others on the 21st of February validate that judgment and that sentence. But his wasn't the only confession. That was the one today. Last week was Chris Sinclair. And some of you in St. Michael are among the 35,000 that have money in Clico. There are people that you would least expect get a little gratuity. Because remember, Clico had agents that used to come in every nook and cranny to people. Clico is a Sagicor. The big people was who would go to Sagicor for the insurance policies. Clico dealt with small people. They only attracted a few of the richer people because of the executive flexible premium annuities. But it dealt with small people. Throughout Barbados. And you heard Owen Arthur from as far back as Sarah's Court in Christ Church last year. And you heard us again on Saturday. And along throughout this campaign, we have told you, we will make wrong things right. With the people of Clico. And we will do it for a number of reasons. Because... People must be able to have confidence in the financial system. The old people used to take the money and stuff it under a mattress, inside the mattress, in a hole in the backyard. I tell a lie. And one of the things that changed in Barbados was that more and more people started to use the banking system and the credit union system. 30, 40 years ago, Mark, people used to bank with the solicitors. They don't do that nowadays because they don't get back the interest that they would get if you put the money in a credit union or an insurance policy or the bank. So if you allow an institution that 35,000 people, or to be precise, 38,500 put the money in and that they can't get it back out people are going to think twice about parting with their money again to go into another financial institution and that is why the Barbados Labour Party passed legislation in 2007 for commercial banks, for deposit insurance. So that if a commercial bank fails in Barbados, 
you are guaranteed to get back $25,000. You with me? The Barbados Labor Party passed legislation that if a bank fails like BCCI again, you can get back $25,000. But there is no such legislation for insurance companies. And therefore, we have said that one, we need to restore confidence to the financial system for the future of this economy and to protect your jobs in the future. But two, it is immoral for a government to give a promise. Not one prime minister, but two. David Thompson and Frandell Stewart. And then a minister of finance. And then a governor of the central bank. And four years, one month later, 49 months to be precise, after Clico fails, people are waiting for their money. Leroy Paris did not have to wait for his bonus. And I gave you the check number. And I gave you the amount at Eagle Hall in April 2010. You remember? I gave you the date. And I defy them. To deny it. And the government of Barbados called Paris and Clico in to a meeting on the 8th of May 2009. A Friday. Pull out your phone and check it. And by the Tuesday, an MOU was signed. A memorandum of understanding was signed with Clico and the government of Barbados. And you know what that memorandum of understanding said? That no dividends were to be paid. No profits were to be distributed. No bonuses were to be paid to employees. No gratuities. But you think it stopped there? When the Ministry of Finance was to receive all of the payments every month from Clico, asked the Ministry of Finance, you can't ask them now because you know, they ain't going to tell you since Chris was listening keenly to Paris in the Ivy the other night. A picture speaks a thousand words. It speaks more words than Frandel saying he is his pal. The picture of David and Paris sealed the notion and the understanding in Bajan's heads under the blanket in Ireland that the two of them were as tight as two peas in a pod. And I'm saying to you, that let the Ministry of Finance tell us. I will wait till the 22nd. Whether they ever received information that Leroy Paris received that check in 2009. But that's not the primary concern. Because he came out and issued a writ in 2010. And in that writ, he acknowledged that when the MOU came to an end in 2010. What was 11, sorry? 2011. That he had received payments again that would otherwise have been in breach of the memorandum of understanding. But you will come to your own conclusions as to why and how he got it. But the confession... And the credibility that is at stake is the confession of Chris Sinclair that they cannot deal with the Clico issue and hiding behind numbers that shows that he needs a calculator. Mark, go and buy and give him one. You live in Northwest, carry it by his office tomorrow. Hope that he can use it before the 21st. Because after the 21st, he will not need a calculator. He will not need a microphone. He will not need a suit. He won't need nothing so. <clears throat> but 
he told the people that you could not afford Owen's package. That it was a billion dollars in giveaways, including 837 million from Clico. When you know that the liabilities of Clico have to be offset by the assets. And the confession was so clear that when we called them out on the fact that the deficit was less than 400 million, still a lot of money, still a lot of money, but that it was not 897, he then said, which is also true, that if you sell an asset now, you cannot get the price that it, you would hope for because it is a forced sale. And we accept that. And that is why Owen Arthur has said from the very beginning that we will settle the issue by way of return of money, long-term instruments. Everybody in Barbados know about government bonds. They got people enough in Bushall, Bangor, Station Hill. People feel that bonds is only big people think that is not true. They got a lot of old men and old women who hold bonds in this country. That we will settle it by money, by long term and medium term instruments, and by tax credits. Because there are young people who pay taxes, that if you give them a tax credit, they will then pay less taxes, and you give them that, because you accept that there is a liability to them because of the money lost in Clico. But the absolute confession is one, again, of incompetence and insensitivity. We have already talked about people on this platform who have gone to the great beyond without being able to get back sent one from Clico. And you know that if a man is 80 or a woman is 75, they don't got time put down. Some young people may not have it either. But the law of averages suggests that an older man or a woman cannot wait 10 years to get back the money. And we already having them wait four. And I am saying to you that that is a confession that they're not up to the task. And it is not that we do not want to settle the people in the Eastern Caribbean because we accept that two prime ministers committed to it. But the Eastern Caribbean people have to come to the table with us too and accept that in the same way the Barbados government is not legally liable for the money but we are doing this to protect our citizens that even if you do not have money in the Eastern Caribbean, you have land. You have a lot of crown lands. And the same company that is going to have to wait holding the assets of Clico until they can get back a better price while the government settles the people can hold some of those crown lands as well to make a difference. So, count one. A confession by the Prime Minister that he can't put money in your pocket and he can't give you jobs. Count two, a confession by Chris Sinclair that he cannot settle the matter for the people of Clico, some of whom are going to the great beyond as we speak. Count three, how many times Chris Sinclair come and tell you that he given Al Barak his money? Every few months. Oh, we are going to pay the 60 million. Oh, we are going to pay that money. I say to you tonight, let them deny they have not paid a single cent to Al Barak. And it is not only wrong to Al, but don't let me hear about what the Barbados Labour Party run up. Because for every day, that they do not pay him. They have been running up interest and they are now responsible for probably about 15 million of that money because of five years of interest. 
You, you understand? But this government only knows how to point fingers. But I don't realize that people got sense. If you take five years and you don't pay the man, and interest running at 8% a day, but who caused the interest to run up? Or in Arthur or them? Let me get real. Let me get real. And once again, it is an issue now of credibility. Now when a man comes and tells you that he is going to settle something and he is the minister of finance, you are supposed to be able to believe him. When a man tells you that he is going to settle Clico, he told us Clico would be settled by June last year. You are supposed to believe him. So count three is credibility on Clico and on Al Barak. And I can find many others. Many, many others. But the reality is that this government has shown that they cannot deal with your issues. John King once sang a song, How many more? How many more must go jobless in this country? How many more must be without money in this country? How many more must withstand the insults and the abuse simply because you hold a different view from them? And I said in Bashar last night, and I mean it, I don't care whether it is this platform or the Democratic Labour Party platform. The days of attacking people because they have a different view from you should be a thing of the past in Barbados politics. So that, ladies and gentlemen, those are just three charges. But if I wanted to add to that the charge of pauperization, I could do so. The problem is that that was led by someone who is no longer on this earth. When in July 2008, $104 million in taxes from bicycle fees to road taxes to fees for professionals to fees for rum shops to fees for cell phones that never even got off the ground because they didn't know what they were talking about. That was put on the back of poor people in this country and middle class people. And that led to the pauperization. And therefore, I could get distracted and have a lot of fun and old talk. Like other people are on platforms in the country, especially in the Dems. But there is one question. And one question to be answered by you. When you decide how to vote next week and that only question is this given the credibility and given the confessions from the Democratic Labour Party do you believe that Frundell Stewart Chris Sinclair and the Dems can lead you back to prosperity in this country come March this year come April this year Come May this year. Come 2014. Come 2015. If they couldn't do it in 2008. If they couldn't do it in 2009. If they couldn't do it in 2010. If they failed to do it in 2011. If they failed to do it in 2012. If they lack the credibility. If they have given the confessions. What causes anybody to believe? That they will suddenly be able to get it. And I place the issue of credibility for those who are a little older and remember 1991. And for those who are a little younger, let me share it with you. <clears throat> I came to public life in 1989 as a candidate in Bushall, Jackson, the Turning. Green Hill, Friendship Terrace, Jackman's, Bournes Village. 
I remember like if it was yesterday. Erskine Sandiford telling us from 1989 and 1990 that this economy was butting like Gary Sobers. You remember that? Do you remember that? Henry Ford went on a platform in January 1991 and he told them at Market Hill St. George that the government was about to enter a program with the IMF. And Sandiford said, no, this economy again is batting like Gary Sobers. This economy was sound. Remember that? That was the January. By September, 28,000 people, the largest number ever, marched the streets of Bridgetown because they were on the verge of sending home 4,000 public servants and taking 8% from your salary. The code word then was sound. The code word today is stable. How can an economy... That is a miniature of what we left it be stable. How can an economy that has gotten smaller be stable? You ever see a person with bad diabetes and who does lose the weight fast, 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 fast? How can it be stable? How can an unemployment rate that is double what we left it at be stable? How can foreign reserves, that is half of what we left it at, be stable? How can a tourism sector that is earning $550 million less than it was in 2007 be stable? How can your pockets be stable when if you are a public servant, you have not had a wage increase since 2010. And this is 2013. But prices have gone up by 35%. I being fair, Lydia. It was 2008 to 2010. Announced in 2008. Finished in 2010. But nothing between 2010 and 2013. And prices have gone up by 33%. And the wages, if you were a public servant, by 10. And if you work in the private sector, by less. But they feel that Barbadians are foolish. And they tell you, this is stable because we haven't sent home anybody from the public sector. But good Lord, if you had sent home anybody from the public sector, we would really be cat spraddle and overturn because 16,000 people lost their jobs and many others are now paupers no savings businesses closing but this economy is stable well I say to you 2013 reminds me so much of 91 and the same way you were deceived in an election to win an election, they are trying it yet again. But if a man tricks me once, and if he tricks me twice, you know that it cannot happen again. You know. And the last major deception for Kung Four is the issue of privatization. I want you to listen to me carefully. All who talking by the bar, shh. Shh. There is one person and one person alone in Barbados who has announced as official policy an intention to privatize the transport board, the sanitation service authority, and the National Housing Corporation. And not only is that one person on record, he is on record in Hansard, which is the official record of Parliament. 
And he's on record to the Chamber of Commerce that something had to be done. But in the actual ministerial statement to Hansard, he admits to having discussions with the Inter-American Development Bank to help fund how best that privatization could take place. Now, how can a man on this side of his mouth tell you as minister, officially, in a parliament that we are duty bound and sworn not to do anything but to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, that he, who is a governor of the Inter-American Development Bank, has entered discussions with them. I didn't say Miss Rabbit Bank. I didn't say a ballroom shop. I said the Inter-American Development Bank. And that he has entered discussions with them on these three agencies. And then, two, three months before an election, when the Barbados Labour Party says we are going to be mature and we are going to join with the government and face the problems, the problems that the Caribbean Development Bank say that we have as recent as Friday, that if Barbados does not get a grip on the amount of money it is spending, that we will turn this entire country on its head. Repeating, the judgment of Standard and Poor's and Moody's and the IMF. But all of a sudden, he actually thought the Prime Minister was going to call the election before the five years, I swear. So he started early, two, three months before. And the Labour Party was to be the biggest criminals for using a word that he owned. I never use the word privatize. I use the word enfranchise. Because my concept of it is that money must share with the people. And if a government can't own something, who better else to own it but the people? Barbados has excess savings. That's the one thing we have. Collectively, it's smaller than it should have been. But it is still more than you need. And I am saying to you, that it is dastardly for the Democratic Labour Party to be running an ad in the papers telling you about a better tomorrow when they are the ones who, only ones, the only ones who have taken any formal action in this country tonight to start a process of review of statutory corporations to privatize them. And what is more dastardly is that they know that privatize does not mean layoff, but they figure that the people that live about St. Michael and St. James and Christchurch, who come from the working class, didn't go to school. Your boss about free secondary education in Errol Barrow all the time, but you forget that the output of free secondary education is that people can think. Not true, Kathy. And when people start to think, as I said in Clevedale down by Ian last week, 10 years since 1951, this country has not been able to meet its bills. 10 years only. 1962, Mr. Barra had to borrow $600,000 to meet the bills of the country. Not the buildings, just salaries and goods and services. The day-to-day -day expenses. 1974, in the oil crisis, Mr. Barra had to borrow again. 1977, Mr. Barra bought 12 million then. 1977, Tom Adams had to borrow a million dollars to meet the day-to-day -day expenses. 1988, just as Sandiford was telling you about the economy, batting like sobers, the next year, he had to borrow 
21.3 million. And in 1991, Sandford and Harold Blackman had to borrow 7.8 million. That's five. You know when the other five years are? You know when the other five years we had to borrow to pay salaries? But you had a confession. In October or November last year, Sinclair came on the radio and told you that he has to borrow money every month to pay salaries in Barbados. I didn't say so. He says so. But what are the facts? 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012. Not one single year. Good Lord, not one. Not even one. Never. Not one. Have they been able to pay the bills of this country without borrowing? And it is because their add-on expenditure without reference to whether you could pay. Maybe you could go in town and buy, 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 buy and can't pay. Lady, you could go in town and buy, 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 buy and can't pay. Wake up Barbara and ask her. She don't open a shop. She gone in tight, tight, tight. And the heart flashing. But you understand what I'm saying? So when a government keeps adding on, adding on, adding on, adding on, adding on, adding on. Know that they got people who are like their children to take care of. You got children, Kathy. You could go and borrow, borrow, borrow uh, to buy. But don't know how you can eventually take care of your children. It's not sustainable. And what they have done is to borrow $1.7 billion in the last five years just to pay salaries. That is not the total they borrowed. They borrowed 2.7. But 1.7 is to pay salaries and to buy goods and services. So as I said, if you have six houses and you have two businesses that got people employed but you have no cash and the bank come and tell you pick your choice I come in for some of this property now what are you going to do? you want to pick fares I want you to pick that I am telling you, what would you do? Would you not take two properties that don't employ nobody, that the body can lose the work pun, sell off the two properties, and get the money to pay down the debt, and got a piece of change more in your pocket to make sure that the bank can't call you again and tell you in a hurry that they're coming to shut down your properties or to foreclose on your properties there is not a single Bajan that I know that will put the wealth or the property of their family in jeopardy because of folly. So you're going to lose everything because you're not prepared to take a hard decision. Your mother left the property for you. You like it. But if you keep it, what's going to happen to you? And then this notion Tell Frondel Stewart that the politics of the 50s done in the 50s. You really believe that a government of Barbados today will sell off anything, including the shares in the airport that Chris Sinclair told you he was going to sell off 30%. He said so in a budget debate on top of the transport board and sanitation and national housing. He told you he was going to sell the BNTCL. He told you he was going to sell 30% of the port. How can this country tolerate a man telling us one thing when he is with the international institutions, when he is with the parliament, but because he comes on a platform and feel that all you want to hear is, darling, do, do I love you? Well, tell him that we do not believe a word.
Because we know what he said on the other side of his mouth. And we also know what it takes us to get out of this situation. If things were good, we wouldn't be having this discussion. If things were good, 16,000 people would not be out of work. If things were good, the prime minister won't be coming telling you that the only way you can get money back into people's pocket is by going to a drug lord. What kind of madness? That is as bad as the statement he made about the Cane Fields and Alexandra School. How much more can we tolerate, oh God? How much more? Now I have said to you Saturday night, we have a team that is good for Barbados. We have Joe Atherley. A man that can speak on any topic. A man that can master from the economy to the social. You know that he's a theologian. But that doesn't get in the way of him dealing with the young fellas. That doesn't stop him from understanding their concept and their dilemma and their struggles. You have Arthur Holder, a man that started as a social worker, a man that understands, come out of Waterford, born in there, and understands the dire needs of people because that's what social workers do, not true. They work with the people in most need. And then he understood that there's some people that leave school without the certificates that they need. And he opened the urban adult college to give people a second chance at life. And as if that were not enough, he felt that he had the capacity to defend from a man's life to a man's property, to a man's dignity. And he became a lawyer and is now one of the top criminal lawyers in Barbados, bar none. Mr. Cool, so cool that you might take a six for nine. But don't do that. I warn you, don't do that. Because it is the cool ones that is be the most deadly. You have Ian Goodenegel, a man that has risen as a young man. How many black Barbadians do you know are head of major departments in the tourism industry in this country? Let me get real. Tourism been going on for 60 years. How many young black men, not yet 50, could be head of human resources for one of the largest hotel groups. In fact, it is the largest now that the government caused Amman to shut down. And a body didn't come and say we want him as a poster chair. He worked his way up. And he has been president of the Barbados Employers Confederation. I didn't say the Spooners Hill Employers Confederation. I said the Barbados Employers Confederation for six years. David Gill, who distinguished pharmacists, yes, but who distinguishes himself as a man. David is the kind of fella, don't care where you tell he don't care where you do to he. He feels that he is born, born to serve the people of Carrington Village and Halls Road and Burns Hill and all about here. He feels that that is his calling in life. And sometimes, you know, in life, why know it? I lost the first time I come out. It didn't stop me from going back in the next day and dealing with the people. Because if you believe in something, you understand that defeat is simply not that the people dislike you, but that they do not know if they're ready for you or they might not understand you at the moment. But after 10 years of Richard Seeley's poor, poor representation, they are calling, they are calling David, come back, star, come back. And he will be the comeback kid of this election. And he's going to take down a man who in spite of the fact that he acts as prime minister has not been able to do a single thing for the people of Carrington Village and Delamere Land and Brunsville, etc. 
and who has presided over tourism earning $550 million less and you getting less and less. Jeffrey Bostick, the colonel, and I don't mean the KFC colonel. Don't mind he's giving and share more food than Todd will ever share because Todd, when he go for his food, he's telling the fellas, no, he coming back, he coming back. He don't stop and offer a man of food. People said that when Todd was working, giving private lessons, he shared more than he shares now that he's drawing $10,000 a month. You can understand that. That in me, that is the people of the city talking. Gregory Nichols, everybody feel that like Chris is the McGuffey. But Gregory, you hear? Gregory is going to fight him to the end. To the end. And he may have the money to buy, buy, buy. But the people want heart, heart, heart. And they want somebody who is going to give them that heart. Ronald Toppin. A woman tell me, I really envy Toppin. Because, because I helped carry the Labour Party platform and candidates in particular. I don't get around as much as I would like. But Toppin is like, you have the energizer. The energizer bunny. He keeps going and going and going and going and going. But that's why he says no stopping, topping, no stopping, topping, no stopping, topping. We have the team. We have the leadership. And we have the team for every sector. But more importantly for you in St. Michael, we have the record. Do you have money in your pocket tonight? Did you have money in your pocket when we were in the government? Are you now prepared to pass a judgment on the confessions and the credibility? On count one, the confession by the Prime Minister that he cannot give you jobs and that he cannot put money in your pocket. How do you find him? On count two, with Minister Sinclair telling the people of Clico that he cannot deal with their problem. How do you find him? On count three, on the issue of credibility. As it relates to Clico and as it relates to promise, 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 promise. For Clico and Barrett, how do you find Chris Sinclair? What is the sentence of the people? What is the sentence of the people? Did you say vote them out? Did you say vote them out? Some say kick them out. Well, that sentence can only become a reality if you, the people, accept that you have the power. And if you have the power and you have the will, then come February 21st, save the people of Barbados. Help Barbados, vote Joe Atherley, vote Arthur Holder, vote Barbados Labour Party. Good night and God bless you.